Panasonic has just announced the Panasonic Lumix S5, which is their latest, smallest, and also lightest full frame mirrorless camera. I have been testing a pre production sample of the S5 over the last month or two and shot about 500 to 600 gigabyte of photos and videos with the S5. So, in this video, I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts, my real world shooting experience, and also my test results that I have done over the last month or two with this Panasonic Lumix S5. If you think the S5 is just a smaller or downgrade version of the Panasonic Lumix S1, it is not true at all. Yes, there are some certain features that is missing or downgraded compared to the S1, but there are also many new features or improvements if you compare to S1 for both photographers and videographers. In some way, I feel it's more like a mini S1 Edge, especially when S5 receives its next firmware update later this year. I will talk about the firmware update as well later in this video. Kia ora, good morning everyone, which one here, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to talk about the latest full frame camera from Panasonic and it is the Panasonic Lumix S5. I remember when the Panasonic Lumix S1, S1R was released just a bit over a year ago. One of the biggest complaints that some people have is the size and the weight of those cameras are too big and they have been asking for a smaller, lighter version of that camera. So this is the answer from Panasonic. The Panasonic Lumix S5 is the smallest and lightest full frame camera from Panasonic. Let me um, just remove the lens from the body. Just look at the size of the lens mount compared to the body. You will know that this is a much smaller camera. The launch price of the S5 is pretty much the same as the Sony A7 III or the Nikon Z6 because if you compare the size or the specs of this camera with those two cameras, they are very similar. So they probably would be the direct competitor with each other. So I have also got the Nikon Z6 and the Sony A7 III here. So in this review, I'm going to do some comparison between these three cameras. And also I will talk about some of the difference between the S5 and the bigger brother S1, just to compare what are the feature, the difference between this one and all the other three cameras. So. This review will probably be pretty long because I have been working on this review over the last month or so. I've done a lot of testing, so I got a lot of information and test results that I'm going to share with you guys. So I don't really know how long this review will be. Hopefully it's not going to be two hours long, but I am going to create a uh, index for this video. So if you are only interested in part of this review, you can just look at the video description, which I should have put a time index for the different topic. You can just directly skip to the topic that you are most interested in. And also try not to make this video super long. I have also separated out some of the discussion and test results into separate videos. I have created a video that is really about vlogging. I have a autofocus test video and also have another video that show you the high ISO difference between these cameras. So if you're interested in those topics, you can check out uh, those other videos on my channel. I would put a link below or you just click on my channel and you can find the other videos. Okay, let's start by talking about the build quality and design of the camera. The Panasonic Lumix S5, it has a magnesium alloy body that is uh, splash proof and dust proof just like the S1, but it is not um, freeze proof. So the S1 is freeze proof, but not the S5. The size wise, it is quite a bit smaller than the S1 and also the weight is also quite a bit lighter. The weight of the S5 is only around 700 gram or so, while the S1 is over one kilogram. So that's like around 30% or so lighter than the S1. If you compare the size of the S5 with the Z6 and the A7 III, they are very similar size. 
the S5 is probably somewhere between the two. The S6 is the largest one and the A73 is a little bit smaller, but the difference is not really big. In terms of ergonomics, I would say the S5 is pretty similar to the Z6. Holding it and pressing all the dials and buttons, it feels very good. It feels pretty much as good as the S1. And the Z6 is also a very good, um, in terms of ergonomic design, it's also excellent. And I actually prefer the grip on the Z6 a little bit more than the one on the S5. But having said that, the S5 grip is still pretty decent and decent size, slightly smaller than the S1, but I think for most people, if you don't have a super big hand, I think holding it is still pretty comfortable. And I would say the a 3 is probably the um, worst in terms of ergonomic compared to the other two cameras. For example, the grip just never feel right to me, even though I don't really have a big hand. One thing I was a bit surprised is that the size of the S5 is actually smaller than the GH5. The GH5 is a bit taller, wider and deeper and it's also heavier than the S5. I think Panasonic has done a pretty good job shrinking down the S1 into the size of S5 while retaining most of the controls and the ergonomics. There are a few things that is missing on the S5 if you compare it with the S1. For example, there's no top status screen and also it doesn't have the PC sync port and there are one or two buttons that is missing. but most of the important controls are still there on the Panasonic Lumix S5. There's one thing that to me is definitely an improvement if you compare to the S1 and that is the power switch. The power switch on the Lumix S5 is the one that is very similar to the GH5 just next to this dial here. That allow me to turn on the camera very easily even if I'm just holding it single hand compared to the S1 which has the dial somewhere here a lot smaller which is a lot harder to um, power on the camera if you are just holding it one hand. To me this is definitely one of the ergonomic improvement if you compare to the S1. And apart from missing the PC sync port, it has pretty much all the input and output ports that the S1 has. It has the headphone jet, it has the microphone jet, it has the USB port, it has the HDMI port and also the remote port and it also has the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So in terms of connectivity, it is pretty much the same as the S1. However, one thing that I'm a little bit disappointed is the HDMI port on the S5 is a micro HDMI unlike the S1 which used the full size HDMI which is quite a bit stronger. I normally wouldn't complain too much for a camera like S5 that doesn't have a full size HDMI port but because of the upcoming firmware update which I'll talk about very soon I really wish the S5 does have a full size HDMI port. Having said that, both the Nikon Z6 and the Sony a7 III, they don't have the full-size HDMI port either. The USB port on the S5 is a USB 3.1 with the Type-C connector just like the S1 and it also supports USB power and also USB charging. Overall, the ergonomics and design of the Panasonic Lumix S5 is very good and also the body feels very solid pretty much just like the Panasonic Lumix S1. While the camera is not exactly designed for professional users, but I feel most professional photographers, if they have to pick up this camera and use it to do their job, it shouldn't be a problem at all. In the past, I have used a Panasonic Lumix S1 to shoot uh, some weddings and that was fantastic. And I can definitely use an S5 to shoot wedding very comfortably. On the side of the camera, we have the memory card slots here. So there are two memory card slots, just like the S1, but the S1 has one CF Express and one SD card, while the S5 has the, both of them are SD card slots. I feel most of the user that this S5 is targeting probably would prefer to have dual SD instead of one CF Express and one SD because they don't have to buy any new memory card, they just can use the existing SD card slot. 
However, there's one thing that I'm a bit disappointed is only one of the card slot is the high speed UHS 2, while the other one is just the uh, slower UHS 1 slot. And the reason I'm disappointed is because even the GH5, which was released how many years, like three years ago, that one already has dual UHS 2 card. S5 only has one UHS 2 card that makes me a bit disappointed. If you compare it with the A7 III, it also has dual SD card slot and also only one of them is UHS 2. And the Z6, it only has one memory card slot, so it's probably not too bad if you compare to those two. However, the new Nikon Z5, it does have two SD card slot and both of them are UHS 2. At the back of the camera at the top we have the electronic wheel finder here which has the 0 0.74 magnification and the resolution is 2.34 million dots so in terms of resolution it is quite a bit lower than the EVF on the S1 or the Nikon Z6 and I can tell the EVF is not as high resolution as the S1 or the Z6 but on the other hand um, the color of the EVF is very nice and it also can support up to 120 frames per second refresh speed and the picture quality of the EVF is also very good if I compare the S5 with the Sony A7 III, which according to the specs, they should be very similar, but I definitely prefer S5 EVF because the image looks quite a bit sharper, the color looks better and also smoother than the EVF on the Sony A7 III. I remember when Panasonic announced the S1, one thing a lot of people complained about was the design of the LCD screen. The S1 and S1 are using that 3-axis tilting LCD screen design. While other people would want to have the um, fully articulated screen that the same one like the GH5 and many other Panasonic Lumix mirrors cameras. So with the S5, Panasonic also give you the fully tilty frippy screen just like the S1H. So that probably should make a lot of people happy especially video shooter who would much prefer this fully tilty frippy screen compared to the free access one which is more designed for photographers and interestingly that makes the s5 the only camera here that has the tilty frippy screen because the z6 and also the a7 3 they both only have a very simple vertical tilting screen just like pretty much all the other mirrorless camera in the market, the S5 also has a mechanical and also a electronic shutter. The mechanical shutter, the fastest shutter speed is 1 over 8,000 seconds. With the electronic shutter, the fastest shutter speed is also 1 over 8,000 seconds. And the slowest shutter speed, you can go down to 60 seconds. Or you can go to the bulb mode if you want to go slower. So this is a big improvement compared to the Micro Four Third camera G5 or G9, which only has a one second slowest shutter speed with their electronic shutter. One difference between the S5 and the S1 is S1's shutter is rated at 400,000 and I don't think S5 shutter is the same and it also has a slightly slower flash sync speed at 1 over 250 seconds. Next thing I want to talk about the battery and it is pretty interesting. The S5 it has a new battery, completely new design which is the BLK22. I said it is interesting not only because it is a new design but because this battery is backward compatible with the GH5 but the GH5 battery is not forward compatible with the Panasonic Lumix S5. And what that means is you can use this new battery on your Panasonic Lumix GH5 or GH4 or GH3 or G9 but the battery that comes with your GH5, you cannot use it on the S5. Even the shape of the battery, you cannot physically fit the GH5 battery on the S5. If you look at the battery, there are actually two 
connectors or say two group of connector there's one group here and there's another group at the top here so this connectors here is mainly designed for the backward compatibility so that you can use it on the GH5 and other older camera that will be using this type of connectors while you use it on the S5 and possibly the other future camera that is coming then it will be using the connectors here the capacity of this battery is about 20% larger than the GH5 battery so that means if you are a GH5 owner you could buy this battery and use it on your GH5 and you have a 20% in theory longer battery life I have actually not done a test to see how many photos I can shot with a single battery but the battery life seems to be very good it seems to last very very long time according to the official figures the S5 battery life when you are taking photo using the LCD screen is approximately 10% longer than the S1 and if you are shooting using the electronic viewfinder it is even up to around 25% better than the S1 so that is definitely very impressive because the S1 is supposed to have a much bigger battery so don't know how but the S5 the battery life is even better than the S1 but while I haven't done any battery life test for taking photos, I have done a test, not intentionally to do a battery life test, but I did a overheat test, which I'm going to talk about very soon. And when I do that test, I um, start with a completely charged battery and I was recording 4K 60 video at the 10 bit output and in the end the battery lasts about 2.5 hour that seems to be pretty impressive because 4k 60 at 10 bit is probably the most power consuming mode that you can run on the s5 when it comes to accessories the s5 there is a optional fully functional battery grip that you can get for people who want to either have a vertical grip or want to have one extra battery to extend the battery life and you can also use the xlr1 which is the xlr audio adapter with the s5 but unlike the Numix s1 you cannot record the high resolution audio on this camera the Panasonic Lumix S5 has a full frame 24.2 megapixel sensor without low pass filter and it also uses a dual native ISO design which I believe is the same sensor as the Panasonic Lumix S1 and it also shares the same processor as the S1 so in terms of image quality which I'm going to show you some result a little bit later on when it comes to the image quality test it should be very similar to the S1 but you can check out the result very soon one thing i find is different to the s1 though is the image sensor cleaning feature with the s1 or pretty much all the panasonic camera that i've used in the past when you use the um, enable the sensor cleaning you don't actually hear or feel anything you may hear some slightly high pitch vibration noise but other than that you don't really know that the sensor is actually doing the sensor cleaning but with the S5, I feel there is quite a strong um, pausing when you enable the sensor cleaning. I'm just about to um, enable the sensor cleaning. There is a much stronger pausing uh, vibration that I can feel when I trigger the sensor cleaning on the S5. Unfortunately, there's no way for me to actually test whether it is improved compared to the S1 but it does feel much stronger vibration so I feel it's probably better than the one on the S1 the overall feeling is actually very similar to the sensor cleaning function on the A7 III which also has quite strong pulsing while the size of the S5 is quite a bit smaller than the S1 it still has the in-body image stabilizer or the IBIS and it is still a 5-axis one. I don't think it is exactly the same as the one on the S1 because if you look at the official um, figures, the rating of this IBIS is slightly lower than the one on the S1. For the IBIS, just by the IBIS itself, 
it is 5 stop effective compared to the S1 which the official figure is 6 stops and if you attach it with a compatible uh, lens that has the OIS and that means you can now enjoy the Dual IS2. The Dual IS2 on the S5 is 6.5 stop compared to the S1 which is 7 stop. I did some testing to see how effective the IBIS is when you are taking photos. So after shooting a couple hundred photos at different uh, settings, my results seem to suggest the IBIS is around 4 to 5 stop effective which is pretty impressive for uh, IBIS only image stabilization. The next thing I'm going to talk about is probably the most controversial subject every time when it comes to the Panasonic cameras and you know what it is, it is the autofocus. The S5 using the DFD autofocus system which Panasonic has been using for a long long time so it supports up to 480 frames per second operation and the fastest autofocus speed according to Panasonic is 0 0.08 second which is very fast and when I test it with the kit lens which is this one which is probably not the fastest lens in terms of the autofocus speed but still the autofocus speed I find it is pretty decent and pretty fast and also there's not much hunting when it's trying to lock on to the target when I'm shooting in the AFS mode there are a couple of pretty big improvements when it comes to the autofocus system on the S5 and one of them is when you are taking photo in AFC mode. With the previous Panasonic Lumix S series camera when you are shooting in the AFC mode, even when you are at a um, stationary position and you are just trying to lock on a target which also doesn't move, you will probably notice there is quite a bit of background pausing even when nothing is moving at all. With the S5, this is much improved. If the camera and the target, they are both stationary and even if you half click the shutter button, you will notice there is a lot less background pausing compared to the previous Panasonic Lumix S camera. I'm not saying there's no background pausing, but if you look at this comparison footage, one is shot on the S1H even using the latest firmware and one is the S5 using uh, actually an uh, earlier firmware than the one I have right now. The S5, the background pausing is a lot less than the S1H. While I don't really know whether the background pausing would affect the accuracy when you are taking photo in AFC mode, that definitely is a bit annoying when you are just trying to target and especially when you're looking through the viewfinder, that is quite noticeable. So I'm really glad that Panasonic managed to heavily reduce the amount of background pausing when you are taking photo in the AFC mode. And in terms of actually tracking subject when you are taking photo in AFC mode, here is a quick test that I did using the kit lens. I um, zoom into the maximum focal length, which is 60 mil, and I also shoot at the maximum aperture, which is 5.6. So this is not a very fast aperture, so probably not the toughest autofocus test. But look at the photos. Every single one of the photo, the camera nailed the focus, and I have actually repeated this test about 10 times, and every single photo is in focus. So that is definitely not bad at all. And Panasonic has also improved its AI tracking. The S5 can detect your body or face from a much further distance. And when I was moving around quickly, the camera can follow me much faster and a lot closer to my actual movement. It is also a lot more reliable, so even if your subject is um, turning the face around or have something that is partially blocking his face or her face, or if the subject is go um, off center, the camera will still try to follow the subject that it was trying to follow. And comparing that with the previous camera, look at this footage, you can see that the S5 tracking algorithm is definitely much more reliable than the previous camera. While the autofocus example I show you were mostly shot in the video mode, the improvements apply to both photo and video shooting. 
when shooting video, the autofocus tracking appears to be more reliable and also responds slightly faster when I compare it with the S1H with the latest firmware. And just like what I have found in my previous autofocus test video, if you increase the frame rate of the video that you are shooting, the autofocus performance would also improve as well. And to those of you who have been following my channel for a while, yes, I have done another autofocus test. So I have uploaded a, a much longer autofocus test video that you can check out. I will put a link below. While overall, I think S5's autofocus performance is not too bad and a lot better than what a lot of people thought the DFD autofocus system would be. Under some condition, for example, when you are shooting video when there's a very strong backlight so that your subject is uh, quite a bit underexposed and especially if you are shooting in the vlog picture profile which has very low contrast in that kind of lighting condition you may find the DFD autofocus performance is not quite as stable as it normally would be you may notice the background pulsing would be quite a bit more obvious and stronger than it usually would be and sometimes in the very worst case it may just drift to the background the good thing is usually it will come back to the foreground subject in a second or two but yeah this kind of thing would happen when the lighting condition is doesn't help the dfd autofocus detection when that happens there are few things that you can do for example instead of shooting in the vlog picture profile if you switch to one of the normal picture profile or make sure your subject is properly exposed if it's underexposed during a bit of exposure compensation if you are shooting in one of the semi auto mode doing one of those things would help improve the performance of the autofocus system and make it more stable okay next let's talk about the photo mode on the panasonic lumix s5 the maximum burst speed for the S5 is 7 frames per second if you're shooting in AFS mode or 5 frames per second if you are shooting in the AFC mode. This is a little bit slower than the S1 and also quite a bit slower than the Sony a7 III. But if you compare it with the Nikon Z6, especially the speed in the AFC mode, then the two cameras are pretty similar. And as you may have expected for a Panasonic camera, it has the 4K and 6K photo mode. If you are shooting in the 4K photo mode, you can go up to 60 frames per second. Or if you are shooting in the 6K photo mode, it can go up to 30 frames per second. It supports the HLG photo mode and also it has multiple um, different aspect ratio that you can choose when you're shooting photos so instead of just the normal 3 to 2 you can have many different aspect ratio for example 2 to 1 it is a feature that i personally don't really use much but when talking to some other photographers they find it very useful and the s5 also has the multi-shot high resolution mode that is not available on the a7 III or the z6 the S1 also has the high resolution mode, so you can output either 96 megapixel or 48 megapixel photo when doing the multi-shot high resolution exposure. But the S5 does have a few improvements over the S1. Now, instead of just outputting raw file, it can output JPEG file as well as the raw file. So it is great for people who don't want to do much post processing themselves. There is another improvement that I think a lot of people would really like is that with the previous Panasonic cameras, when you do the multi-shot high resolution photo, there is a limit. The shutter speed, the slowest you can go is one second, which is not really that slow when you are taking landscape photos. Uh, for a lot of reasons, you would want to go slower than that. For example, you want to capture a slow shutter speed photo. You want to capture some cloud movement or you want to smooth out the water. Then you want to go slower than one second. And also when you are shooting under low light condition, you don't always want to bump up the ISO, especially you would need a tripod anyway when you're doing the multi-shot high resolution mode. So, the slowest shutter speed now you can choose when shooting the multi-shot high resolution photo on the Panasonic Lumix S5 is now 8 seconds. This much slower shutter speed 
definitely can um, open up a lot more possibility and also help to improve the image quality when you are doing the multi-shot high resolution photo on the Panasonic Lumix S5. Another new feature that comes with the Panasonic Lumix S5 is the live view composite photo mode. This is the feature that was previously available on Micro Four Third camera, but this is the first time that it is available on a Panasonic full frame camera. If you're not too familiar with what this feature is, basically the camera will continuously taking uh, many many shots and brand them together and also render it in real time so that you can see the result on the screen immediately after the camera has updated with the previous frame and you can stop it when you think you got the exactly the result that you want so this is very useful when you are taking for example a nighttime landscape photo when you want to have some traffic light trail in the foreground or for example when you are taking astro photo when you're doing the star trail photo this is a photo that i shot in my garden at night i basically just point the camera up to the skies and then i start the live view composite mode and then i just check the photo every few minutes until about 30 minutes or so i feel like this is the effect i want so i stop the camera and this is the end result i got so i don't need to go into the photoshop and just try to stack all the different layers together and blend them together myself it's all done by the camera and one very nice thing is the camera can output either jpeg or raw or both when you are doing the live field composite photo so it depends on whether you want to do post posing yourself or not you can get the camera to output either jpeg or raw while i really like this live field composite mode because it allow you to capture light trial very easily i think Right now, the functionality is still a little bit limited. For example, I like to see um, the camera offer you different kind of branding mode. And also, when you are shooting in the live view composite mode, right now you do have a limitation, shutter limitation. You cannot go any faster than 1 over 1.6 second shutter speed. It means if I want to use the live view composite mode during the day, I do really have to use an ND filter or the photo will be completely overexposed. With the 24.2 megapixel full frame sensor on the Panasonic Lumix S5, the ISO range that you can choose is from ISO 100 all the way up to extended ISO 204,000. So this is pretty much the same ISO range as the Sony a 7 III and the Nikon Z6. So I did some high ISO comparison tests with these three cameras and also I have included the Panasonic Lumix S1H just to see how the high ISO performance is like with these four cameras. So um, I have another video with all the results that I can show you. But a quick summary is the high ISO performance of the S5 is very good. The image quality, it remained very clean, even up to ISO 25,600. You can even say up to ISO 51,200, the image is still very usable. And if you go up from there, then you can see the image uh, starting to degrade quite quickly. And if I compare these four cameras, I would say the Panasonic Lumix S5, the, in terms of the JPEG file, actually is the cleanest and the best quality um, among these four cameras. But having said that, the difference between these four cameras are actually very small. So you have to do a side-by-side -side comparison photo like this if you want to tell the difference. And even so, you do have to look at it at 100% zoom and look at it for quite a while, then you can see a bit of difference between these four cameras. So I think in terms of the high ISO performance, there really isn't much difference between these four cameras. Now, because I'm working on this review before the camera was announced and there's no um, raw reader that is officially released for the Panasonic Lumix S5. I still want to see how the raw file is like when you compare to the other cameras. So I did some hack and hack the S5 raw files and get the Adobe Lightroom to load it. And 
When I compare the raw files, I think the result is also very similar to what I saw when I compared the JPEG file. Up to ISO around 25,600 or so, even without noise reduction, the image quality is still really good. And if I compare the photo at the maximum ISO 204,000 ISO, um, the quality is also very similar. And I would still say the raw file from the S5 is marginally better than the other camera, but it's really marginally. The difference is again very small between these four different 24 megapixel full frame cameras. Okay, now let's talk about the video mode on the Panasonic Lumix S5. With the S5, you can record 4K video up to 60 frames per second, and you can also record it in 10 bit or 8 bit output, and you can also record it internally or externally. When you are recording the 8-bit 4K, uh, if you're recording in 24 or 25 or 30 frame, then there's no crop, it's using the full frame sensor. If you're recording in 50 or 60 frame per second, then there would be approximately 1.5 crop, just like the Panasonic Lumix S1. The S5 also has the VLOG flat picture profile, and it comes with the S5 and already unlocked already. So unlike the S1, you don't have to separately purchase the upgrade key to unlock the 10-bit or the VLOG flat profile. With the 10-bit output and the VLOG picture profile together, the Panasonic Lumix S5 can capture 14 plus stop dynamic range. So that is excellent if you have to shoot under very high contrast lighting condition. The maximum bit rate when you are shooting 10 bit 4K 50 or 60 frames per second video is 200 megabit per second, or when you are shooting 10 bit 4K 24, 25 or 30 frames per second video, then the maximum bit rate is 150 megabit per second, which is exactly the same as the Panasonic Lumix S1. And in terms of the video quality, I found the video I captured using the S5 is pretty much the same as what I captured using the S1. It's very sharp, very nice color, and if I shoot in 10 bit with the VLOG picture profile, it handles high dynamic scene very well. If the video features I have talked so far still hasn't impressed you, there is a new firmware update that will be coming soon before the end of the year for the S5. With this new firmware update, you will be able to record raw video with a supported Atomos video recorder. You will be able to record raw video up to 5.9K at the frame rate up to 30 frames per second, or 4K raw file up to 60 frames per second, or anamorphic video up to 50 frames per second. So this is pretty much exactly the same as the S1H with the latest 2.1 firmware. This firmware update will also give you cinema 4K video recording, vectorscope display, shutter angle and GAN operation and more. So this will really make this S5 a mini S1H. If you are shooting 8-bit 4K video at 24, 25 or 30 frames per second, there is no time limit. The camera support a memory card hot swap, so you can swap out the memory card while it's still recording. And also, you can also use a external USB power source to power the camera. So that means in theory, you could just record as long as you wanted. If you are recording 4K 50 or 60 frames per second video, or recording 10-bit video internally, then there is a 30-minute time limit. Having said that, you can immediately press the trigger button again when the camera stops the 30 minutes and you can start another recording. And just to find out whether the uh, camera would overheat if you recording 4K 60 or 10 bit video, I did a test to see whether the camera would overheat or how long does it take for me to overheat the camera. Now. I did this test back in July here in New Zealand, which is winter, so it's a little bit cold. It's not too cold here in Auckland, like the temperature is around mid 10 degrees Celsius, around 15, 16 degrees normally. Um, indoor, actually, it will be a little bit warmer, but to make the test 
a little bit more meaningful, I actually just turn on a heater in my room and keep it on running for a while before I start the test. I waited until the room temperature increased to around 25 degrees Celsius. So it's probably still not like super hot, but at least it's definitely not a winter temperature. I set the camera to record in 4K 60 and 10 bit output. And also I leave the autofocus to AFC mode and also I have the iBus turned on. So just try to make the camera work as hard as possible. And I start the recording because the camera has a 30 minutes time limit when I'm recording in 4K 60 10 bit. So what I did is I have it running and I will wait until it reached 30 minutes, I would immediately swap the memory card because my biggest memory card is only 64 gigabytes. So I swap the memory card and then I will re-trigger the start of the recording pretty much straight away. So I keep it running and running and running. After two hours and 18 minutes, the camera finally shut down. And it didn't shut down because it overheated. It shut down just because the battery after recording more than two hours of the 4K 10 bit 60 video, it just completely ran fat. And at the time I measured the temperature um, of the back of the camera and it was still under 40 degrees Celsius. So it's only barely slightly warm. Now, it doesn't mean the camera would not overheat when recording video. I mean, if you take it to a desert and shoot some video on a very hot day, it probably would still overheat and it might be quite quickly. But for a lot of people, it probably wouldn't be a problem at all. The camera also has a new mode on the mode dial, which is the SNQ mode. What it does is it allow you to capture slow motion or the quick motion video very easily by just switching to that mode on the mode dial. Previously with the previous uh, Panasonic camera, you have to enable the slow motion or the quick motion video by going to the menu, find it and then enable it. So with this SNQ mode dial, it just make it a lot easier. And for the slow motion video, you can shoot in 4K up to 60 frames per second. Or if you are shooting in the full HD resolution, you can go up to 180 frames per second, just like the S1. If you are shooting in the 180 frames per second for HD, then there is a bit of cropping. If you shoot at 150 frames per second, then there is no cropping. But for me, I was mostly shooting at 120 frames per second because one improvement that the S5 has over the S1 is that you can finally has autofocus when you are shooting slow motion video. Not having autofocus at all when you are shooting slow motion video with the previous Panasonic camera is something that I have complained quite a bit in the past. So I'm very happy to see that the Panasonic Lumix S5 finally also has this uh, slow motion autofocus feature. The only other Panasonic mirrorless camera that has the slow motion autofocus support is the Panasonic Lumix S1H. Just like the S1, the S5 also has the waveform display and also the Zebra display to help you ensure your exposure is correct. And you can also enable the Vlog Visual Assist to help you um, visualize the picture a lot better when you are shooting in the Vlog picture profile. The S5 does have some other new features. For example, it has the red record frame display. So what that is, is when you are recording video, it will display a red border um, around the frame so that you know that you are actually recording. That is something probably pretty useful when you are doing vlogging because sometimes you may not actually notice you actually not recording, you thought you are already recording. Another new feature that is good for people who want to shoot some video for social media is that the S5 also support vertical video recording. The S5 also support time code output, so this is another feature that the S1 doesn't have. And speak of feature that S1 doesn't have, there's another one that the S5 has is it support anamorphic video. Previously, the only full frame Panasonic camera that support anamorphic video is the Panasonic Lumix S1H. So the Panasonic Lumix 
S5 also supports it and it also supports different type of lenses. It supports 1.3x, 1.33x, 1.5x, 1.8x and also 2x anamorphic lenses. And the S5 will also be supported by Panasonic's Lumix teetering app. So if you want to do some teetering shooting or if you want to do some live streaming using the, um, the special version of the teetering app. So that is possible with this Panasonic Lumix S5. I've also done some tests to see what is the video quality is like when I'm shooting video at high ISO using the Panasonic Lumix S5 and also shot some comparison video using the Sony a7 III and the Nikon Z6 and the Panasonic Lumix S1H. Um, if you want to see the full test results, you can check out my high ISO comparison video on my channel. But a quick summary is the S5 it seems to have the best high ISO performance when you are recording 4K video. It seems to be even marginally better than the S1H, which is something that surprised me a little bit. But yeah, um, the high ISO performance when shooting video with the Panasonic Lumix S5 is definitely very impressive. When the Panasonic Lumix S1 was released, there were quite a lot of complaints, especially about the LCD screen design because people were thinking the S1 is a full frame GH5, which it really isn't. The S1 was primarily designed as a professional photographer's camera, but just because it is a Panasonic camera, so it does have some very nice video features. But now with the S5, it is more like a full frame GH5 because it is a camera that is designed for both photographer and videographer. And also the size of this camera is very similar to the GH5 as well. Actually a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter despite the sensor on this camera is four times the size of the sensor on the GH5. With the 4K up to 60 frames per second and also 10 bit and VLOG already enabled that you can record either internally or externally, the fully articulated screen, anamorphic video support, slow motion video with autofocus, the S5's video feature is better than the S1 and very close to the S1 Edge. And with the new firmware that will be coming before the end of the year, which allow raw video recording and also the cinema 4K and a few other video feature upgrade, this really make the S5 a mini S1 Edge that is a lot lighter, a lot smaller and also quite a bit cheaper as well. And for photographers, I think you appreciate the improved high resolution mode and also the new live view composite mode. But if you are primarily a photographer which using the EVF to shoot photos most of the time, I think the S1 will probably still be the better camera for you because of the much higher resolution EVF on the Panasonic Lumix S1. In terms of autofocus, which is probably Panasonic's biggest weakness, the autofocus system on the S5 is definitely an improvement compared to the previous Panasonic cameras I have tested in the past. It is more stable, more reliable and also with less background browsing. There are definitely still room for improvement. For example, all the workarounds that I have talked about um, in this video, I wish I don't have to use the workaround and the camera can handle all the different conditions for me. I understand Panasonic, they are working really hard to improve the autofocus system as they probably know that this is the biggest area that they are not quite as good as most of their competitors. And if you are a S1 or S1H or S1R owner, the new autofocus improvement and features that is available on the S5 will also come to you as a firmware update before the end of the year. I would say for most users, the S5 is probably the best overall full frame camera from Panasonic right now. If you give me an S1, S1 Edge, S1 R and an S5 for me to choose, I would probably pick the S5 for myself. Is the S5 the perfect camera? Probably not. I don't really think there is 
ever a perfect camera. But if you look at the photo image quality, the video quality, the feature available, the body design, the size, the weight, and price, if you look at them all, I think Panasonic S5 is probably as close as a perfect camera you can find in the market right now.